The Battle of Waterloo, 1418-15, saw the final defeat of Napoleon Bonaparte. At the end of an eight-hour struggle, nearly 50,000 dead and dying men lay on the battlefield. Intriguingly, the battle pitted two formidable generals, both born in 1769 against each other, Napoleon Bonaparte and the Duke of Wellington. A clash of military heavyweights. Napoleon had fought about 80 battles, losing about 10. Wellington had fought 30 and had never been defeated. But despite those records, they'd never met each other in battle. That all changed on the 18th of June, 1815, when they faced each other at Waterloo. This is the story of when Wellington fought Napoleon at the Battle of Waterloo. Napoleon had risen to military prominence in the French Revolutionary Wars. In 1799, he took control of France in a coup, and in 1804, crowned himself Emperor of the French. From then on, the wars between France and a host of European powers came to be called the Napoleonic Wars. By 1814, when the nations allied against him finally invaded France, Napoleon was forced to abdicate. He was banished to the island of Elba in the Mediterranean. But that exile didn't last long. In March 1815, Napoleon slipped out of Elba and landed on the southern coast of France. Marching inland, his old soldiers flocked to his cause, and he entered Paris in triumph. The other European powers, caught completely off guard, now scrambled to deal with this renewed threat. Napoleon's strategy was to knock out the two Allied armies closest to Paris, the Prussians and a British-led coalition in modern-day Belgium. The British-led force, which consisted of Dutch and German troops as well as British, was commanded by Arthur Wellesley, the Duke of Wellington. Wellington had first come to prominence as a military leader in India, but his star had soared when he commanded the British army in the Peninsular War. From 1808, he won notable victories against the French, slowly pushing them out of first Portugal and then Spain, and eventually he crossed the Pyrenees and invaded France itself. Despite besting the French armies in the Peninsular War and establishing himself as Britain's most formidable military leader at that time, Wellington had never met Napoleon in battle. But that was going to change very soon. On the evening of the 15th of June, whilst attending a ball hosted by the Duchess of Richmond in Brussels, Wellington was informed that Napoleon had crossed into modern-day Belgium. Just the very next day, the French defeated the Prussians. Napoleon now sent 30,000 men under Marshal Grouchy after the retreating Prussians to make sure they kept moving and didn't try to team up with Wellington. The same day, another French army under Marshal Ney met Wellington's army at Catrabra. Despite holding off the French with the Prussians in retreat, Wellington was in danger of being outflanked by Napoleon and fell back towards Brussels. He then received word from the Prussian commander, Marshal Blücher, in which the elderly Prussian warrior promised that he would join forces with Wellington. Together, their armies would outnumber the French. So with that promise, Wellington decided that if Napoleon wanted a knockout battle, he'd give him one and hope the Prussians arrived in time. On the afternoon of the 17th of June, the British general decided to make a stand on a series of ridges astride the road to Brussels, just south of the small village of Waterloo. To the front of the ridge, he positioned troops inside two farms, Hugomont and La Haye Santé. Both of these fortified positions will feature heavily in this story. Through the night, Napoleon gathered his and Ney's forces opposite the ridge. And throughout the night, it rained heavily. By the following morning, the ground was so waterlogged that Napoleon's artillery officers urged him to delay the battle until they could manoeuvre their guns into position. Napoleon, an artillery officer by training, who had made cannon bombardments a key to his battlefield successes, agreed. His 72,000-strong army at Waterloo ever so slightly outnumbered Wellington's 68,000. It's easy when looking at the paintings of the Battle of Waterloo and the way it's stamped into British culture with Waterloo Station, etc., to believe that Wellington's army consisted of 68,000 British redcoats. But that was far from the case. Only about a third, 23,000, came from British regiments. The rest of his army consisted of 17,000 Dutch and Belgians and 20,000 Germans coming from the states of Hanover, Brunswick and Nassau. The large Dutch contingent was commanded by William, Prince of Orange, the 22-year-old heir to the throne of the Netherlands, and known in the British army as Slim Billy. Wellington lamented that his, to use his words, infamous army was pretty raw. Napoleon's army, on the other hand, consisted of veterans from previous campaigns, although probably his very best troops lay dead in Russia. So whilst numerically both sides were pretty balanced, Napoleon had the edge in experienced troops. 
he also benefited from a whole army speaking the same language. But Napoleon had another advantage too. Artillery. When he finally could manoeuvre them through the mud, he had 256 cannon, compared to about 160 for Wellington. And this artillery advantage very nearly changed the course of history. The battle commenced shortly after 11 o'clock in the morning, on the 18th of June, 1815, with the French guns delivering a barrage against Wellington's army. The British artillery returned fire, and whilst this duel continued, Napoleon's brother, Jerome, attacked the farmhouse at Hugomont. The farmhouse had been garrisoned with men from the Coldstream and 3rd Foot Guards, later the Scots Guards. Overnight it had been fortified with loopholes in the walls and all the entrances, save the north entrance, barricaded. And it was this north entrance, which remained open for supplies and reinforcements, which was the fortification's weak point. The French had spotted it, and they rushed to enter that gap. A fierce battle ensued, as the guards under Lieutenant Colonel James MacDonnell desperately tried to close the massive gates, whilst the French, led by an officer armed with an axe, tried to smash their way through. Eventually, Sergeant Graham managed to bring down the bar on the door, securing the gate for the British. Prince Jerome's attack was intended to divert troops away from Wellington's centre, where the main French attack would concentrate. Wellington, aware of this danger, was meagerly with his reinforcements to the farmhouse, sending just two battalions along with ammunition to support the defenders. The same tight husbanding of numbers was not reflected by Prince Jerome, who threw more and more men at the farm. Ultimately, he would concentrate nearly 14,000 men in the vicinity of Hugomont, a fifth of Napoleon's army at Waterloo. So rather than draining Wellington's army, the assault on the fortified farm actually drained Jerome's older brother's forces instead. The British at Hugomont would hold out to the very end of the battle. It was now 1.30 in the afternoon. Marshal Ney proceeded to the next phase of the battle plan, and ordered the 17,000-strong infantry corps under Jean-Baptiste Comte Elon to attack Wellington's centre and left. The attack was preceded by yet another half-hour bombardment from 74 French guns. As the French cannon roared into life, Wellington ordered his regiments to retire behind the ridge and lie down. This allowed the mainly British regiments to sit out the artillery barrage in relative safety. But not everyone found safety. General Breland's Dutch-Belgium unit found themselves in an exposed position and suffered the full brutality of the expert French gunnery. Now the French infantry started to move up towards the deserted ridge. As they crossed the ridge, they were met by a volley and a bayonet charge from three Scottish regiments, the Royal Scots, the Black Watch and the Gordons, under the command of Lieutenant General Sir Thomas Picton. They were joined in their attack by the 44th East Essex Regiment. Leading from the front, Picton was killed with a shot to the head. With Picton lying dead, the British charge started to run out of steam and the French reformed their lines and returned fire. It was at this stage that Lord Uxbridge ordered his cavalry forward. 2,000 men from the Household Brigade, the Union Brigade and the Cavalry Brigade thundered towards the extended French lines. The Household Brigade under Lord Robert Somerset consisted of the 1st and 2nd Life Guards, the Royal Horse Guards and the King's Royal Dragoons. During the charge, Somerset would lose his hat, and while searching for it afterwards, a cannonball tore a hole in his coat and killed his horse. Lord Robert's younger brother was also at the battle. 26-year-old Fitzroy Somerset was serving on the Duke of Wellington's staff and would lose his arm in the battle. He is better known to history as Lord Raglan, the British commander during the Crimean War. Meanwhile, the Union Brigade, commanded by Major General Sir William Ponsonby, consisted of the 1st Royal Dragoons, the 6th Inniskillen Dragoons, and the 2nd Dragoons, later known as the Royal Scots Greys. Only the Royal Dragoons had any recent combat experience, and the Union Brigade had only come together three weeks previously in response to this crisis. Finally, the charge was completed by Vivienne's Hussars, including the cavalry of the King's German Legion. This fascinating British regiment will feature later in this story, so keep your ears open. The mounted charge, on top of the fierce resistance from Picton's brigade, had a devastating effect on De Elon's corps. The sheer weight of 2,000 horses, not to mention 2,000 sabres, smashed through his regiments. Over 3,000 of his men were killed or wounded, and a further 3,000 surrendered. As the Scots Greys rode into the 45th French Regiment, Sergeant Charles Ewart captured their eagle. It was one of two French eagles captured that day. The other one was also captured by the Union Brigade in this charge. What isn't disputed is it was captured by the 1st Royal Dragoons. 
What, however, is disputed is who actually captured it, with Corporal Francis Stiles and Captain Alexander Kennedy Clark both claiming the credit. In the heat of the moment, and possibly also due to their lack of battlefield experience and discipline, the Union Brigade continued to charge all the way to the French guns, which they proceeded to attack. It was a glorious charge, as captured in paintings like Scotland Forever by Lady Butler, but it had exhausted their horses. When Napoleon ordered his own cavalry to counterattack, the British horses and their riders were overwhelmed. The commander of the Union Brigade, Sir William Ponsonby, was killed, as were nearly half of his men. It was now about 3pm, and apart from the ongoing fight at Hougoumont, there was a lull in the fighting. Through the smoke of the battle, Marshal Ney thought he observed Wellington's centre falling back. Actually, what he observed was wounded men seeking treatment, and his own captured men being sent to the British rear. Drawing the wrong conclusion, that this was the moment to seize the advantage and sweep the Anglo-Allied army from the field, Ney ordered the French cavalry to attack. Unfortunately for Marshal Ney, Wellington was not retreating, and had no intention of doing so. On the far side of the ridge, his infantry formed squares to receive the cavalry attack. And for the next three hours, those British squares stood firm through 12 attacks by 9,000 French cavalry. With his cavalry attack achieving nothing, Ney now turned his attention to Leye Santi farm in front of the ridge. The farm was defended by the King's German Legion. I mentioned this fascinating regiment a little while ago. The Legion was made up of men from the state of Hanover in Germany. At that moment in history, the monarch or elector of Hanover was also the monarch of Great Britain, King George III. In 1803, Napoleon had occupied the tiny state and many of its soldiers fled to Britain. And here, the exiled soldiers were formed into a new fighting force, the King's German Legion. Despite its name and roots, the King's German Legion had actually been an integral part of the British army since 1805, and their fighting ability was highly regarded. 6,000 of the Legion served at Waterloo. And it was a detachment of these men who were holding the farm at Les Santi. They had arrived there the previous night, and assuming that the farm was an overnight stop, the men of the Legion had torn down the main wooden gate to use as firewood. They had fortified the farm as best they could, but unlike at Hougoumont, they didn't have a gate to slam shut in the face of the two battalions of French infantry bearing down on them. It was now that William, Prince of Orange, ordered the Legion's 5th Battalion to advance down the ridge to reinforce their beleaguered comrades. They were caught by the French cavalry marching in line and before they could form a square, they were ridden down. This event forms part of the storyline in Bernard Cornwall's Sharp's Waterloo. Incensed by the Dutch Prince's stupidity of not ordering the men to form a square, Sharp takes a shot from distance at the Prince of Orange. In reality, the Prince was indeed wounded in the shoulder by a musket ball at Waterloo but he survived to inherit the throne of the Netherlands. The defenders of the farm held the French off for over an hour, but by 6pm they were out of ammunition, and the French finally swarmed in. Only 39 of the 360 men from the King's German Legion inside survived. As a footnote, the Legion was disbanded in 1816, after the war, and many of its members joined the reformed Hanoverian army. With that objective taken, Ney brought his artillery within close range of the British on top of the ridge. Wellington's men now faced a withering barrage of canister shot. Canister is effectively a shell containing musket balls, which disintegrates in mid-air, rather like a giant shotgun. Fired into the massed ranks of the Allied, principally British troops, at just over 200 yards, it was devastating. The 30th and 73rd regiments lost so many men that they were forced to combine their numbers. The 33rd were so weakened that they sent their colours to the rear because they feared being overrun by the French. The British and their allies were hanging on, but only just. And Wellington was heard to mutter, either night or the Prussians must come to save his force. With the British line obviously weakening, Ney asked Napoleon to send the elite Imperial Guard forward to finish Wellington's army. Napoleon, however, had something else to worry about. Blucher had indeed kept his word to Wellington. As the afternoon had worn on, more and more Prussians started to arrive on the eastern flank of the battlefield. This is exactly what Napoleon had feared. That was why Grouchy had been sent to chase them away. But here they were. And where on earth, for that matter, was Grouchy? Napoleon needed to act fast. He decided to send the Imperial Guards to bolster his eastern flank before joining Ney. That delay would prove crucial for Wellington. 
It was now 7pm as Napoleon saluted his elite guards marching past him. First came the middle guard, and then the old guard. As the name implies, these latter men were the longest serving, most experienced and most loyal of Napoleon's troops. However, thanks to the disastrous campaign in Russia, along with the rapid mobilisation in the last 100 days, the old guard formed just three battalions. So Ney decided to use five battalions of the middle guard to lead the attack, with the old guard in reserve. The first Allied troops they met were Sir Colin Halkett's brigade, consisting of those regiments who had borne the brunt of Ney's canister artillery offensive, the 30th, 33rd, 69th and 73rd foot. Already severely weakened, they were thrown back by the assault of the middle guard. Wellington's line was finally about to be broken. But as the French pressed forward, they themselves now came under furious artillery and infantry fire from the 3rd Netherlands Division, who, without Wellington's authority, had rapidly moved forward to offer support. Their first brigade, consisting of Belgian as well as Dutch soldiers under Colonel Detmers, pushed the middle guard back with a bayonet charge. Meanwhile, the third chasseurs of the middle guard reached the top of the ridge to find it deserted. Maybe another breakthrough, but the ridge wasn't deserted. The British Guards Brigade, consisting of two battalions of the 1st Foot Guards under General Maitland, were lying in wait in the grass. Supposedly, Wellington shouted, Now Maitland, now's your time! And with the cry of Up Guards, the two battalions stood and fired a devastating volley into the French. Before the stunned Imperial Guard had time to reform their lines, Maitland's men followed up with their own bayonet charge. After the battle, the 1st Foot Guards, under the assumption they'd faced the Grenadiers of the Middle Guard rather than the Chasseurs, were renamed the Grenadier Guards, and their ceremonial bearskin helmets are a nod to the bearskins worn by the Imperial Guard. As the French tried to stabilise their lines, they now faced a volley followed by yet another bayonet charge in their flank, this time by the British 52nd foot. All along the ridge, the fabled Imperial Guard started to retreat. Wellington now rode to the edge of the ridge and with a wave of his hat, ordered a general advance. The French army broke. With the Prussians streaming onto the battlefield and uniting with elements of Wellington's army, the Battle of Waterloo became a rout. The old guard fought to the end. When a British officer asked them to surrender, they famously replied, the guard dies, but does not surrender. Napoleon fled the battlefield, heading for Paris. Behind him, he left 25,000 of his men killed or wounded, and a further 8,000 captured. The Battle of Waterloo was the end for Napoleon. The phrase to meet one's Waterloo has become part of the English language, meaning to meet complete defeat. And so it was for Napoleon. Four days later he had abdicated, and by early July the Allies had occupied Paris. Napoleon finally surrendered to the British aboard HMS Bellerophon, which appeared in both my stories about the battles of the Nile and Trafalgar. He was to be exiled to the tiny island of St Helena in the South Atlantic, midway between Africa and South America, and he would die there in 1821. But as Wellington said, the battle was the nearest run thing you ever saw in your life. His own army had taken a pummeling, 15,000 dead or wounded, a quarter of his strength. The Prussians too had lost 7,000 men as they kept Blucher's promise to unite with Wellington. With nearly 50,000 casualties on both sides, as he looked around the battlefield, the victorious Wellington wrote, Nothing except a battle lost can be half as melancholy as a battle won. In popular culture, the Battle of Waterloo became a defining moment in British history when the British defeated Napoleon. As you've probably realised from this talk, that's not entirely correct. Of course, the British were most definitely there and they made up a sizeable part of Wellington's army. But the Duke of Wellington commanded an Allied army consisting of Dutch, Belgians and Germans as well as British. Indeed, a sizeable part of his own British army came from the King's German Legion. And those nationalities played crucial roles in the battle, just as much as the British. The efforts of the Prussians cannot be ignored either. Had they not put pressure on Napoleon's flank, maybe he would have released his Imperial Guard against Wellington earlier, and who knows what might have happened then. And their final arrival on the battlefield, just as Wellington ordered his general advance, meant there was no way the French could have rallied. And yet, whilst it's an Allied victory, it was a victory that couldn't have been achieved without those 20,000 plus British troops. But above all, it was a victory that couldn't have been achieved without Britain's general, 
the Duke of Wellington. Had he not held his international army on that ridge for over eight hours against a more experienced, more cohesive enemy which outnumbered him nearly two to one in artillery, there would have been no victory. The Prussians would have found themselves outnumbered and staring a defeat in the face, especially when Grouchy arrived with his forces. By whittling Napoleon's army down, exhausting them and holding on until the Prussians arrived, Wellington ensured victory. Waterloo was not merely a battle between two armies, or indeed between the British and the French. It was a battle between two commanders. The only time that Napoleon met the Duke of Wellington in battle. Both Napoleon and Wellington were born in the same year. They fought their first battles within 12 months of each other. Napoleon fought over 80 battles, losing about 10. Wellington, in comparison, only fought 30 battles, but didn't lose a single one. When they finally fought each other on the 18th of June, 1815, it was Wellington who was victorious. A victory that finished Napoleon once and for all, and changed European history forever. Thanks for joining me today, and I hope you enjoyed that story from British history. Next time I'll be taking a look at the Duke of Wellington as he fights the French in the Peninsula War, so please subscribe so you don't miss it. In the meantime, check out some of my other videos. Thank you for your support, keep well, and I'll see you again very soon.